Heavenly Father, we just come before you and we thank you for the nation we live in and the freedoms we, we still have here and what, what an honor it is. And Lord, we just thank you that we can freely gather together to worship you and to study your word. And Lord, as we look at grace this morning and uh, begin our study on grace and what that's all about and what you've done for us, where we are at and where we are now, we, Lord, we can't thank you enough. We just pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning, encourage us, and Lord, if there are any that don't know you, any that are listening on the radio, the internet, television here at the church, minister to their hearts, draw them to you. And as always, Lord, as we worship you, we just pray it comes from our hearts. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This morning, we'll be once again in Psalm 119. Starting in verse 113. I hate those who are double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I wait for your word. Depart from me, evildoers, that I may observe the commandments of my God. Sustain me according to your word that I may live, and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Uphold me, that I may be safe, that I may have regard for your statutes continually. You have rejected all those who wander from your statutes, for their deceitfulness is useless. You have removed all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments." I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. My eyes fail with longing for your salvation and for your righteous word. Deal with your servant according to your loving kindness and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act, for they have broken your law. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, yes, above fine gold. Therefore, I esteem right all your precepts concerning everything. I hate every false way. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 as we continue our study through this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. Now, before we get to our text this morning, let me set the stage for what we're going to be talking about with this story. Harry Truman told the story of a man who was hit on the head and fell into a deep coma. He stayed there for a long time, and people thought he was dead, so they sent him to a funeral home and stuck him in a coffin. At 2 o'clock in the morning, all alone in this dimly lit room, he sat up and looked around. Good night, he said. What's going on? If I'm alive, why am, in this, why am I in this casket? And if I'm dead, why do I have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> Something to think about. You know, the truth of the matter is, as we saw last week, apart from Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Physically alive, yes, but spiritually speaking, dead. We're like zombies walking around being directed by the course of this world, not really thinking for ourselves anymore, but letting society, letting this world fo force us into the direction that it wants us to go. And we are just like, you know, lemmings, just following the leader. You know, Paul in Romans 12, 2 said, Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, the first word I want to look at is the word conformed. And when something is conformed, it, is, it outwardly takes the shape or form of whatever exerted pressure on it. If you take water and pour it into a pitcher, then the water conforms to the shape of the pitcher, but, you know, it's still water. And that applies to people as well. You see, as the world puts pressure upon us to conform, many don't resist. And they give in, and what you see is that the ideals, the thinking of this world are manifested in their lives. And I realize, you know, people get upset about that. You know, hey, I'm, a, I'm my own person. I do what I want to do. 
I got to be me. Now, as hard line as that may be, it's not really true. You're being conformed to the things of this world. 74% of people feel that the moral and ethical values of young people are deteriorating. 74%. They're part of that statistic. Think about it. One person wrote this, and this is not from a Christian perspective, but I thought it was interesting. He said, there is no place for morals in the society of young people. I am a young person, 20 years old, and from experience, I would say that morality has definitely broken down for my generation. Just watch TV, listen to modern music, research the messages modern media give to young people, and it's not hard to understand why. It's not uncommon for a girl of 18 or 19 to have many sexual partners, often even partners that share the same friendship group. Most of my friends take drugs, sleep with people. They only, meet a, only met a couple of hours ago unprotected, lie and deceive people, and they think nothing of it. I don't know whether this is because they actively decide to do wrong or whether it has simply become the norm and it's accepted that this is how life is. Also, the mental makeup of young people nowadays is all over the place. I know from experience that a lot of young people suffer from depression, confusion, and conflicting emotions. Society has become fickle and shallow, where quick fixes and quick thrills seem to be all the rage. Instead of appreciating longevity, hard work, which will have lasting positive results, and looking into life from a deep perspective, maybe I'm the weird one or the odd one out. However, my own personal morals will not let me be sucked into the normal way of life for young people these days. You know, that's an interesting perspective he has, and I applaud him for standing up for what he believes, but guess what? If you don't have a guidebook and you are not empowered to live as God wants you to live, it's, how do you know what's right and what's wrong? You're going to be conformed to someone's ideas, someone's philosophies. Think about it. Where in this world would... You have to figure out which bathroom to use. America. I mean, think about it. With all the problems we have in America today, financial problems, medical issues that are all over the place, joblessness, drug abuse, suicide, marriage issues, our national debt is out of control. Murder. I mean, I could, I, they were showing statistics of murders in Chicago. It, it blew me away. It's like a war zone there. They're sending out thousands and thousands of cops over this holiday weekend to try and drive down the rate of murder in Chicago. And they're saying, well, these guys that are doing it saying, hey, the only way you're going to stop us is if you get in our way. Well, that is an evil heart. But we're not dealing with those issues. We're dealing with what bathroom to use. How crazy it is. And I'll tell you what. Our children are being indoctrinated with sin, the acceptance of sin. They're being indoctrinated with this idea of a global government. I mean, did you see the protests in Britain? Now, millions of people protesting, hey, we want to be part of, you know, the uh, EU. We want to be part of this... European community, even though they lost that vote. They're being warned of all the calamities that are coming, so they need to be prepared. And they are working to conform our children into their image or the image that they want. As parents, grandparents, teachers, Sunday school workers. We're here to teach them the things of God, to lead them in the right direction. The world wants to conform them, and it's so easy to do. You know, I share with you before, when I was, you know, in, in uh, elementary school, we used to go to the Brookfield Zoo, and they had those plastic molds that you can get, you know, tigers and elephants and stuff. And we loved that. You know, it probably cost 50 cents back then or 25 cents. And we put the money in and here comes these two metal pieces coming together and they inject the mold 
And what comes out is the elephant or the tiger or whatever, you, uh, whatever the machine was going to make. It conformed to the image of the mold, and that's what our society is doing, people. And, and we're allowing this to happen. You know, it amazes me how little influence the church is having these days. And I think the reason that the church is not impacting the world is because we're so busy focusing on ourselves. It's all, what do you have for me? What about me? That's never the issue. The issue is always others. It's Jesus, others, yourself. There's the joy. One of the missionaries we support is they're out of Jordan, they're working in Jordan, and Paul Billings, his family, are traveling, they're in Iran right now, they're going to teach a vacation Bible school, they expect 250 kids there in Iran, plus they're going to be teaching the youth there as well. A little side note, he's been battling kidney stones during this trip. Do you think the devil is trying to stop him from doing the things of God? Absolutely. The amazing thing is it's not stopping him. I can't imagine. I've never had a kidney stone. But from what I've seen, and I worked in hospitals, I've seen people who have them, it's nasty. I mean, I, we put people on morphine and stuff to help. Okay? So, he's going. Hot weather, you know? dangerous. Iran is not a, you know, welcoming country. <laughs> but there he is with his family. Why is he doing that? Because he realizes how important it is to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to a people who have never heard it before. And our nation was founded upon Judeo-Christian principles. And we've talked about this many times before. But look how far we've moved away from those principles. And the reason we've moved away from that is because we've moved away from God. We've turned from Him. And so we make our own moral decisions. And look at the trouble we're in. My son Tony had mentioned to my wife that there's this woman, I think she's out of, um, she's from Arizona. Actually, she was, she was a man, but became a woman, and then she became a dragon. And she doesn't want to be called he or she, wants to be called it, which has got the transgender people in an outrage because you shouldn't be called it, you need to be called he or she, which is kind of funny because they're intolerant of this woman who's now a dragon, but that's okay. That's another story. But she had her, he had her ears removed, Nose is uh, removed. The whole face is like a dragon. The heart of man is depraved. It's wicked. The Bible says, Jeremiah says, it's desperately wicked. Don't we see that today? Have you listened to the news? Look at the things that are going on. Heart, the heart of man is desperately wicked. You know, when Christianity comes into a community, into a country, it elevates it. It doesn't destroy it. It makes it better. When Islam comes into an area, what happens? It's destroyed. Because only God can give life. It lifts up the morals of people's lives. But today, because we removed God, we don't know what's right or wrong anymore. And we've seen this coming throughout the years. You know, I'm sure you've looked at some of the reports, you know, in colleges where they ask students, was Hitler wrong in what he did in killing millions of Jews? And some couldn't answer that. They couldn't say it was wrong. How do you not? 
How do you not? Because they don't know what's right or wrong. It's all relative. You may think it's wrong, but you may think it's right. So hey, we'll just all agree to disagree. We'll all be happy. And No, that's not how it works. There is right or wrong and wrong. Did you ever get pulled over by a police officer for speeding? And when you got pulled over and he came, you know, you were going 25 miles over the speed limit, I'm going to have to give you a ticket. Did you mention to the police officer that in your reality you were going the right speed limit and, you know, you don't think you should get a ticket because, you know, can't we just get along? What do you think he would say to you? Here's your ticket. Have a nice day. <laughs> there are rights and wrongs. Let's face it, guys. And apart from Christ, listen in, back in uh, Ephesians 2, where Paul says, and starting in verse 1 in the middle portion, this is where, how we were apart from Christ. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. In other words, just being conformed to this world, directed by Satan. And it's happening at an alarming rate. But you know what? Here's the wonderful thing. You don't have to be conformed to this world if you're in Christ. You know, yeah, we may have walked that way at one time, but no longer. No longer conformed to this world, being transformed by Christ. And, you know, in Romans 12, 2, when Paul speaks of being transformed by the renewing of your mind, that word transformed is a metamorphosis. And I always think of it like this, a caterpillar that goes into the pupa stage and metamorphoses into a beautiful butterfly. You know, <clears throat> it's, not, it's not the same as the caterpillar. It dissolves in there and it reforms into something completely new. Kenneth Wiest, he's a Greek scholar, puts this Romans 12, 2 like this. So then stop assuming an outward expression of the, that does not come from within you and is not representative of what you are in your inner being, but is pattern after this age. But change your outward expression to one that comes from within and is representative of your inner being by the renewing of your mind, resulting in your putting to the test what is the will of God, the good and well-pleasing and complete will, and having found that it meets, spef spe meets specification, placing your approval on it. You see, in Christ, we're a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all the things have become new. The problem for people outside of Christ is they try to make outward changes, but there's nothing that has changed inwardly, and so... You could play the part for a time, but eventually your true colors will be seen. Paul's saying you've got to fill your mind with the things of God. What comes into your life will then flow outwardly in the things you do, the things you say. The outward transformation is affected by the inner change in the mind and the spirits, the means of transforming our minds through the Word of God. And we think about it. Can you eat junk food all the time and expect to be healthy? No. And you can't fill your life with all kinds of garbage and expect good to flow from it. It won't happen. God's word is truth. That's the solid meat that we need to ingest into our lives. You know, David said, how can a young man cleanse his way? I mean, that's a great question because of all the things that we're bombarded with today. How can we stay clean? How can we do the right thing? And in Psalm 119, David said, By taking heed according to your word, with my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. There it is. Knowing God's word, obeying God's word, but you have to take it into your life instead of the philosophies of this world. See, this is not just an outward change. But like the caterpillar, radically changed from the inside out. And God does the work on the inside. Like I said, as we read his words, we are sensitive to the Spirit, Holy Spirit and what he's telling us. 
We are transformed into the image of Christ. His nature is seen in us and not the world's philosophies. And that is so important in the days we're living in today. You see, that old life, that old condition that was being conformed to this world, we were dead to God at that time. We couldn't commune with God. But when we came to Christ, he transformed us. And our spirit communes with God. And God speaks to us as we read his word, as we pray, and so on. So as we begin reading here in Ephesians chapter 2 this morning, keep in mind we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Dead to God. Nothing that we could do about it. We couldn't resolve that problem on our own. And if Paul just ended there, that would be pretty tragic, but he doesn't. He doesn't leave us in that condition. God doesn't leave us there. And so let's pick up Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at starting in verse 4 and see what the Lord has for us this morning. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I don't know if this impacts you as much as it does me, but when I read those two words, but God, wow, those are so precious to me. They change everything. You see, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We couldn't rectify that problem. And people try to do that today, and they can't attain what they're looking for. They can't get a relationship with God through their own merits. It's hopeless. It's tragic. But God. Think about this. Let me read this a little differently to you and see how this impacts you. I'm sure this is going to lift you up. I'm sure it's going to encourage you. But Joe, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Does that help you at all? What do you mean? That, that hurts my fragile self-esteem. Can't, I can't help you. I can't do anything really for you. The condition you're in, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. What can I do? Nothing. And think about it. Put Buddha in there. Put Muhammad in there. Put Krishna. Put any false god in there. And it's meaningless because they can't do anything about the condition that you're in. Only God can. And when we see, you know, but God, that's a good thing. But look at what it says in relation to us, but so-and-so, but man. That's always in a negative, right? Think about it. Your parents, when you were younger, oh, mom, dad, can I get those M80s? I mean, they're really cool. No, you can't. You're going to blow your head off. But mom, but dad, right? Is that a good thing? No, it's not. We're challenging them. They know better. They know we would blow our heads off with those things. But there's always hope with God when it says, but God, praise God for that. Because he can do something about this condition we're in. One writer put it like this. He said, Howard Sugden, my pastor when I was in college, preached many memorable sermons. After all these years, the one titled, But God, still makes me stop whenever I come to those words in the Bible. Here are a few examples of verses that encourage me with the reminder of God's righteous intervention in human affairs. Remember Joseph and how he was uh, sold into slavery by his brothers. Well, years down the road, this is what Joseph said to his brothers as Joseph was his second in command over all of Egypt. He said, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to save many people alive. There it is. You tried to do something evil. You tried to destroy me. But God stepped in, and he took care of it. And look where I'm at today. Psalm 49, verses 14 and 15. Their beauty shall be consumed in the grave, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. Absolutely. Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Yeah. 
I mean, sometimes we're just overwhelmed with brokenness, despair. But God is the strength of my heart. He's the one that encourages me. Romans 5, verses 7 and 8. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. And 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. I has not seen nor ear heard the things which God prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. I mean, think about it. If you're ever discouraged, you're down, go look at those verses, but God. He loves you. He cares for you. God is more than able to deal with the problems we have in life. And here's the biggest one. We may not see it as the biggest problem, but this is the biggest problem in our life this separation that sin has brought about with our God. Our sin has separated us from him, dead in our trespasses and sins, but God. The question is, can he do it, though? That's one of the first questions. Can he do it? Well, notice what it says. He's rich in mercy. You know, mercy speaks of not getting what we deserve. We deserve death. And before a holy and righteous God, think about it. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is like filthy rags before him. But God's mercy is so rich, it's so deep, that he's willing to spare our lives. One writer put it like this. He says, as they were corrupt in their nature and sinful in their practice, they could possess no merit nor have any claim upon God. And it required much mercy to remove so much misery and to pardon such transgressions. Absolutely. But God, who is rich in mercy, he can do it. But will he do it? You know, there's things that we can do. Will we do them? What about God? Will he do it? Will God spare us? Will he save us from our sins? Well, again, just read on. God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. God can do it because he loves us. His love is great. And we need to recognize this because, you know, in the church today, uh, we're painted as cute, adorable people. We're wretched sinners, okay? God didn't die for cute, adorable people. He died for sinners. And think about it. If we were such great people, why would God have to die for us? We're already great, but we're not. We're stiff-necked and rebellious, and wow, God steps in. Remember what we read in Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that is love, isn't it? We didn't deserve it. And he died for us. That's agape love, unconditional love, not based on anything we have done. It's based totally upon his love towards us. He died for the ungodly. In fact, the word for in Greek is huper, and it, it's a word that speaks of for the sake of or in behalf of or instead of. Christ died for the sake of the ungodly. That's what he's done for us. He died for ungodly people. And if you, you're still confused about that, if you're really not sure, all you have to do is read Romans chapter 1, verse 18, through Romans chapter 3, verse 20, and it will show you that we are all sinners separated from God. Paul systematically dismantles everyone and says we're all sinners. He finally concludes in verse 23 of Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the word all means all. Every one of us have fallen short. And God yet loved us so much, he did this for sinful man who was in rebellion against him. Wow. Spurgeon kind of summarizes it like this. If Christ died for the ungodly, this fact leaves the ungodly no excuse if they do not come to him and believe in him unto salvation. Had it been otherwise, they may, might have pleaded, we are not fit to come, but you are ungodly, and Christ died for the ungodly, why not for you? There it is. 
We all fit that. We're all ungodly. Christ died for us. We just need to receive that gift by faith. He didn't die for the good or the lovely, the likable. This one songwriter said, there is no sin you can imagine that is uh, what's stronger than is love. He died for us sinners. Some people think they've got to clean themselves up before they come to Christ. No. The reason you come to Christ is because you're unclean. You're a sinner. And you know what? God takes care of the rest. And it's called the sanctification process, and it's a lifelong process. It ends when we go to be with the Lord. The wonderful verse in, in John chapter 3 that Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So, so amazing, this love that God has for us. And the whole reason he sent the Son into the world was to make us happy, right? It doesn't say that, huh? No, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, we were sinners separated from God. We needed salvation. That's the most important thing. And this is God's ultimate proof of his love for us. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.21. I know I've quoted this a lot, but it's an amazing verse. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Wow, that's what God has done. He's taken my sin upon the cross of Calvary. He's paid the penalty for that sin. And he's imputed into my life his righteousness. Now, I'm not saying that as Christians we never sin. We do. But in a positional sense, when the Father looks upon us, he sees us as perfect. He sees the finished product as white as snow. In a practical sense, we're still dealing with sin in our lives. The sanctification process where God is molding and shaping us into the men and women he wants us to be. And I guess, you know, we ask the question, will God do it? I don't think that's the right question. The right question is, will you receive the gift? God will do it. Will you receive it? He loves you so much, he's extended the gift to you. But you have to receive him into your life. I believe it was Jeffrey Dahmer who accepted Christ in prison. People go, oh, there's no, look at, what the, look at what he did. There's no way he could be saved. I don't know. I don't see that here. If he came to Christ, he is saved. Mother Teresa, not saved. How could that be? Look at all the good she's done. Apart from me, you can do nothing good. Nothing that God will accept. You see, her salvation was not based in the finished work of Christ on the cross at Calvary. Her salvation was based on her works. How she lived a life where it was hard. You know, There were beds donated to her, the play, uh, um, shelters that she was uh, building. And she, would, she wouldn't even sleep on them. She'd sleep on the floor because she felt the more she suffered, the better it was before God. Well, that's just foolishness, man. If you're giving me a bed, I'm sleeping in it. That's just the way it is. Salvation is not based on good works. It's based on a finished work upon the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. And you have to receive that by faith. Now, here's another question I'll throw out. Is there any evidence that God has done this? Well, all I can tell you is look at the lives of those people who were dead in sin and now have been made alive in Christ. The transformed lives. I mean, millions upon millions of lives. Your life. Paul said in Ephesians 2.5, Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together in Christ by grace you have been saved. And so, we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. That's what required. We couldn't be justified before God by our own efforts. For by grace we've been saved. Unmerited favor. 
And if you can't receive it, if you think you can enter in by your own, pride will keep you out. Grace is, like I said, unmerited favor. And the best way I could explain this is, if you add any works to grace, then it's not grace anymore. Now it's works. And if you're working your way into heaven, God owes you heaven. How many of you believe that God owes you a place in heaven? I'm glad none of you said that because none of you do. None of us. But God has graciously extended that gift to us by faith. It's a free gift. We don't deserve it. Some of you have heard the story about Rosaria Champagne Butterfield. She had, wrote a book, My Train Wreck Conversion. She was, now get this, okay, Rosaria was a leftist, lesbian professor who despised Christianity. Now think about that. A leftist, lesbian professor. I mean, most of us would write her off. Let's say, but there's no way. But the Lord brought her to saving faith through the love that Others showed her the love of Christ. She wrote this. The word Jesus stuck in my throat like an elephant tusk. No matter how hard I choked, I couldn't hack it out. Those who professed the name commanded my pity and wrath. As a university professor, I, I tired of students who seemed to believe that knowing Jesus meant knowing little else. Christians in particular were bad readers, always seizing opportunities to insert a Bible verse into a conversation with the same point as a punctuation mark, to end it rather than deepen it. Stupid, pointless, menacing. That's what I thought of Christians and their God Jesus, who in paintings looked as powerful as a Breck shampoo commercial model. As a professor of English and women's studies, on the track to becoming a tenured radical, I cared about morality, justice, and compassion. Fervent for the worldviews of Freud, Heckel, Marx, and Darwin, I strove to stand with the disempowered. I valued morality. And again, when you think about that, the morality that she deemed right, not what God deemed right. This is her views. And I probably could have stomached Jesus and his band of warriors if it weren't for how other cultural forces buttressed the Christian right Past Pat Robertson's quip from the 1992 Republican National Convention pushed me over the edge. Feminism, he sneered, encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. Indeed, the surround sound of Christian dogma, commingly with Republican politics, demanded my attention. After my ten tenure book was published, I used my post to advance the understandable allegiances of a les leftist lesbian professor. My life was happy, meaningful, and full. My partner and I shared many vital interests, AIDS activism, children's health and literacy, golden retriever re rescue, and Unitarian Universalist Church, to name a few. Even if you believe the ghost stories promulgated by Robertson and his type, it was hard to argue that my partner and I were anything but good citizens and caregivers. The GLBT community values hospitality and applies it with skill, sacrifice, and integrity. I began researching the religious right and their politics of hatred against queers like me. To do this, I would need to read the one book that had, in my estimation, got so many people off track, the Bible. While on the lookout for some Bible scholar to aid me in my research, I launched my first attack on the unholy trinity of Jesus, Republican politics, and patriarchy, in the form of an article in the local news newspaper about promise keepers. It was 1997. I was a broken mess. I didn't want to lose everything that I loved, but the voice of God sang a confident love song in the rubble of my world. It's interesting how God was working on her even at this time. The article generated many responses so that I kept, my, kept a Xerox box on, my, on each side of my desk, one for hate mail, one for fan mail. But one letter I received defied my filing system. It was from the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. It was a kind and inquiring letter. Ken Smith encouraged me to explore the kind of questions I admire. How did you arrive at your interpretations? How do you know you're right? Do you believe in God? Ken didn't argue with my article. Rather, he asked me to defend the presuppositions 
that undergirded it. I didn't know how to respond to it, so I threw it away. Later that night, I finished it, I finished, fished it out of the recycling bin and put it on, back on my desk, where it sat or stared at me for a week, confronting me with the worldview divided the demand confronting me with the worldview divide uh, that demanded a response. As a postmodern intellectual, I operated from a historical materialist worldview. But Christianity is a supernatural worldview. Ken's letter punctured the integrity of my research project without him knowing it. With the letter, Ken initiated two years of bringing the church to me, a heathen. Oh, I had seen my share of Bible verses on placards at gay parade marches, or gay pride marches. Those Christians who mocked me on gay pride day were happy that I and everyone I loved were going to hell was clear as blue sky. This is not what Ken did. He did not mock, he engaged. So when his letter invited me to go together for dinner, I accepted. My motives at the time were straightforward. Surely this will be good for my research. What I want you to get from this so far is, where was the love at these marches? Where's the love of Jesus? I mean, how would you feel before you got saved if, you know, people came up to you and said, hey, you, you know, turn or burn? Hell, smoking or afterlife, smoking or non-smoking. I mean, we have to think about how we're presenting Christ. Just because we're friendly to people doesn't mean we accept the things that they're doing. You know, Kurt and Luke shared that, you know, one of the guys that sometimes they go witnessing with gets real angry and is arguing and yelling at the people. Have you ever seen Jesus do that? I've never seen him do that. Oh, he got mad at the religious leaders because they should have known better, but not the common people. The religious leaders, yes. Common people, no. He had compassion and love for them. And that's what this pastor is doing, is just showing the love of Christ to this woman. And the story continues on. Something else happened. Ken and his wife, Floyd, and I became friends. They entered my world. They met my friends. We did book exchanges. We talked openly about sexuality and politics. They did not act as if such conversations were polluting them. They did not treat me like a blank slate. When we ate together, Ken prayed in a way I had never heard before. His prayers were intimate, vulnerable. He repented of his sin in front of me. He thanked God for all things. Ken's God was a holy and firm, yet full of mercy. And because Ken and Floyd did not invite me to church, I knew it was safe to be friends. I started reading the Bible. I read the way a glutton devours. I read it many times the, that first year in multiple translations. At a dinner gathering my partner and I were hosting, my transgender friend, Jay, concerned cornered me in the kitchen. She put her large hand over mine. This Bible reading is changing you, Rosaria, she warned. With the tremors, I whispered, Jay, what if it's true? What if Jesus is real and the risen Lord? What if we are all in trouble? Jay ex exhaled deeply. Rosaria, she said, I was a Presbyterian minister for 15 years. I prayed that God would heal me, but he didn't. If you want, I will pray for you. Now, isn't that interesting? There was a demand. Hey, I'm a minister. I want to be healed. If I'm not, then God's not real. Is that how God works? No way. Rosaria said, I continued reading the Bible, all the while fighting the idea that it was inspired. But the Bible got to be, a bigger, got to be bigger inside of me than then. Uh, then I. I had overflowed in my world. I fought against it with all my might. Then one Sunday mo morning, I rose from bed, from the bed of my lesbian lover, and an hour later sat in a pew at the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. Conspicuous with my butch haircut, I reminded myself that I came to meet God, not fit in. The image that came in like waves of me and everyone I loved suffering in hell vomited into my consciousness and gripped me in its teeth. I fought with everything I have. I didn't want this. I did not not ask for this. I counted the cost. And I did not like the math on the other side of the equal sign. It reminds me a lot of Paul on the road to Damascus, right? Who's this 
It's not you, Lord, is it? Yeah. It, 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 <laughs> but God's promises rolled in like sets of waves into my world. One, Lord, one Lord's Day, Ken preached on John 7:17. 7, if anyone wills to do God's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. This verse exposed the quicksand in which my feet were stuck. I was a thinker. I was paid to read books and write about them. I expected that in all areas of life, understanding came before obedience. I wanted God to show me on my terms why homosexuality was a sin. I wanted to be the judge, not one being judged. But the verse promised understanding after obedience. And I wrestled with the question, did I really want to understand homosexuality from God's point of view, or did I just want to argue with him? I prayed that night that God would give me the willingness to obey before I understood. I prayed long into the unfolding of day. When I looked into the mirror, I looked the same. But when I looked into my heart through the lens of the Bible, I wondered, am I a lesbian, or has this all been a case of mistaken identity? If Jesus could split the world asunder, divide marrow from soul, could he make my true identity prevail? Who am I? Who will God have me to be? Then, one ordinary day, I came to Jesus, open-handed and naked. In this war of worldviews, Ken was there. Floyd was there. The church that had been praying for me for years was there. Jesus triumphed, and I was a broken mess. Conversion was a train wreck. I did not want to lose everything that I loved. But the voice of God sang a confident love song in the rubble of my world. I weakly believed that if Jesus could conquer death, he could make, my, make right my world. I drank tentatively at first, then passionately of the solace of the Holy Spirit. I rested in private peace, then community, and today in the shelter of a covenant family, where one calls me wife and many call me mother. I have not forgotten the blood Jesus surrendered for this life, and my former life lurks in the edges of my heart, shiny and still like a knife. Now, before we read that story, there, we, we, we would probably think there was no way possible that this person could be saved. But look what happened to her. Left this lesbian professor who despised Christianity is now a believer. There is a transformed life. How was it done? Through love, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit working on our heart, convicting her. She's probably read the Bible before she got saved more than some Christians read it their entire lifetime. That's sad. But it was the Word of God opened up to her by the Spirit of God that brought her to that saving faith. This is the evidence that God has done this, the transformed life. It's amazing. And that's just one testimony. I mean, you can read the story of Mutiny on the Bounty and see how these people who are on this island now almost killed each other until the last remaining man found the Bible and began to read it, and God saved, and it changed everything. Transformed lives. So we're saved. God has taken these dead spiritual bodies, made them alive again. And what position do we have now? Well, look at what God has done here in verse 6 of Ephesians 2. God has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now you read that and think, hey, wait a minute, I'm sitting in church today. I'm not sitting in the heavenly places. What does that mean? What is the point of that? Well, the Greek verb here for stated is in the errorist tense, and what it means is that this is an absolute fact, even though it's not taken place yet. You could take it to the bank. We will be seated in the heavenly places, not maybe. You know, Paul in Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14 said that God has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his Son, the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's what God has done. We're part of his kingdom. We're no longer part of Satan's kingdom. And our focus is the Lord. We live according to his word, opened up to us by his spirit. We have fellowship with the Father through the Son by his spirit. And Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 1 that we will receive this inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and doesn't fade away, reserved in heaven for you. 
who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Ah, what a precious promise. You know, Paul in Philippians 3.20 says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as, as you're living in this world today, don't you feel more like an alien, like a stranger, that you don't even fit in anymore? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm 57 years old, and, you know, when I got saved some 30-plus years ago, it is nothing like today. It is nothing like today. You know, I grew up with Leave it to Beaver, you know, Rob and Laura Petrie. You know, the, you know, the parents never slept in the same bed. You never saw that. I love Lucy. Now... It's incredible, the immorality. And how even on shows like America's Got Talent, it's not just the talent, it's the story now. The gay story, the gay lifestyle. Nobody loves me. Everyone hated me. I was made fun of. Hey, I'm sorry you were. But you know what? You've got to get beyond that. And you'll never get beyond it apart from Christ. But what we're trying to do is conform the people of this world to the image of this world, the image that this world wants us to be like. And the devil is behind it. And so we're being bombarded by all this stuff, like I said. And the more the world gets wicked, the more we don't fit in. But I'll tell you what, as dark as things get, we're a light. I mean, as a kid, didn't you play with flashlights and you love to make the room as dark as you can? And you turn on the flashlight and wow, it just lights up the room. Try turning on a flashlight in the middle of a bright sunny day. Not too impressive, is it? But when it's really dark and you turn on the flashlight, boom, light. That's us, guys. And the world doesn't like it, so it tries to extinguish the light, to put out the light. And we need to be careful. Because we are going to be seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is in our home. One day we're going to go to be with the Lord. And Paul says, you know, we eagerly wait for our Savior. Oh, I sure do. How long do I have? I don't know. However long I have, I'm going to use it to the fullest. No one knows. And then we are on display for all to see. And it's kind of like that transformed life. It's, you know, people are looking at us. They're watching how we live out our faith. And I'll tell you, you know, you may feel that, you know, you're at work or whatever in your neighborhood, no one's watching you. They are. I guarantee you, they are watching what you do, what you say, how you react in certain situations. Because they know you're a Christian. I saw it with my mom. You now she watched me and my wife like a hawk as Christians. She watched how we raised our kids. Well, she's not saved yet. We're still praying for her. But there's the witness. And here's the thing. We live out our faith because of what God has done in us. And what we're seeing today is we're moving away from the truth. We're moving away from the power. The gospel message the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Does the message need to be changed? No. You don't water it down. You speak it forth. You live it out. And for eternity, God's exceeding riches of his grace are going to be displayed in us. Think about that. The riches of his grace are going to be displayed in us. Why? 
Because the angels are going to be looking, they're going to go, man, God saved Joe? That is amazing grace. I cannot even believe that. And I'm on display. They are seeing the rich grace that God has extended to us. It's all about grace. We don't deserve it. And it's all based, guys, being in Christ, not apart from him. And you see that throughout the New Testament, you see the pictures and types of Christ in the Old Testament. It's all about grace, and we'll talk more about that next week as we look at, for by grace you have been saved through faith in that, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's what we're going to be looking at. But let me share this about grace, because, and again, some of you heard this story, but I'm amazed how God works sometimes, because in the most impossible ways he does some amazing things and we kind of like shoo them aside oh that's not going to work that's not going to don't do that hey you need to be listening to what god is telling you to do we're told that several years ago bill moyers uh did a documentary film on the hymn amazing grace and he included a scene from wembley stadium in london they had all kinds of musical groups there mostly rock bands um and they gathered together in a celebration of the changes in South Africa. And no one really knows why, but the promoters scheduled an opera singer. Okay, you got all these rock bands, and then you have an opera singer. Does that sound right? And it doesn't. But her name was Jessie Norman. Uh, she was the closing act. And in the film that Moyers put together, the film cuts back and forth between scenes of the unruly crowd in the stadium and Jessie Norman being interviewed. So 12 hours. Groups like Guns N' Roses were playing, blasting the crowd with you know, speakers just boom, 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 and you know, all kinds of booze and dope going on throughout the place. And they were yelling more, you know, they wanted more. Uh, but here's this documentary, Jesse Norman's in her dressing room discussing the song Amazing Grace. It was written by John Newton. John Newton wasn't a good guy, he was a very cruel guy. He was a slave uh, trader. And he first cried out to God during a storm at sea that was so violent it looked like he was a goner. And Newton, Newton was raised in a Christian home, but he was definitely wasn't a Christian to this, up until this point. And he came, came to see the light, and he applied his trade even after his converse, conversion. He still was a slave trader until he, he came to his senses and saw that was wrong. But he wrote the song, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds while waiting in an African harbor for a shipment of slaves. And he renounced his profession. He became a minister. He joined William Wilberforce in the fight against slavery. Understand, Christians were fighting against slavery. And John Newton never lost sight of the depths from which he had been lifted. He wrote, an amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. That's the reality. Well, back to the film, Jesse Norman tells Bill Moyers that Newton may have borrowed an old tune sung by the slaves themselves, redeeming the song just as they had been redeemed. And finally, the time comes for Jesse Norman to sing. A, circle of, a single circle of light follows her, a majestic African woman wearing a flowing African robe, she strolls on stage. There's no backup band, no musical instruments to accompany her, just Jesse Norman. Now think about this. All day, 12 hours, you know, bands like Guns N' Roses, there's drugs and alcohol. People are stoned, they're drunk, it's wild. And here comes this woman, there's a, one light on her, there's no musical instruments, no band at all. And from the crowd, you can see this happening. They're yelling, more guns and roses. And it kept getting louder. And here comes Jesse Norman, and she begins to sing very slowly. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And here's the amazing thing. By the time she reached the second verse, 
was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fear is relieved. The crowds were all listening. When she got to the third verse, "'Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home." Several thousand fans are singing al along with her. Wow. Can you imagine that? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Those words stilled the hearts of those people. Did any of them get saved? Did any of them turn to the Lord? I don't know. I don't know. But they did hear about the amazing grace of God that was for them. And many of them knew that song which is pretty incredible because I know when I was growing up, I don't think I knew that song. But here they are, singing. That's what God has done in our lives. It's amazing grace. Taking these dead spiritual lives made them alive in Christ. And the only thing we've added to our salvation, and I've told you this before, is sin. We can't save ourselves. We can't do anything to save us except receive the gift that's been given to us by God. It's not that we deserve it. It's a grace gift. And so look at what we've seen here this morning with, but God. Can he do it? But God who is rich in mercy. Sure he can. Will he do it? But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us? Yes, he will. Evidence that God has done this, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. The evidence how we live out our faith. The position we have raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ah, awesome. And we are on display for all to see the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Never forget that, guys. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you have done, but God, and you can fill in the rest and what he's doing in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those two words, but God, because they change our lives. As Jesus comes in, our, our whole lives are transformed. We're a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What a precious promise to us, Lord. And we thank you so much that what you began in us, you will complete that, Lord, you are continually working in and through our lives each and every day. And what an honor, what a privilege that is to be transformed by our Creator into men and women that you want us to be. Thank you, Lord, so much. Help us to live out our faith. Help others to see it. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.